out of the game. Hi, I'm Kelsa Dickey, the CEO of the Financial Coach Academy and my financial coaching business, Fiscal Fitness Phoenix. My coaching journey began more than a decade ago with me helping people for free from my dining room table. What was once a little business of mine has grown into a seven-figure company that employs a team of people. My goal is simple, to help you fall more and more in love with financial coaching. I believe financial coaching is the most rewarding way to make a living. If you are an aspiring financial coach or have been coaching for years, I'm here to help you create a business you love that gets your clients massive results. Let's get to it. Hey, financial coaches, welcome to episode 65 of the Financial Coach Academy podcast. I am really excited for today's episode. I have a guest with me today, and we are going to talk all about financial coaching for married couples. So without delay, let me introduce my uh, expert for today, David Peterson. He is the founder of Married Money Financial Counseling, where he focuses on helping couples improve their money and their marriage at the same time. Drawing from his background in ministry-based marriage counseling, David blends counseling communication tools with financial coaching for a unique and transformational experience. The goal is to save marriages through savings accounts. I love that. David has helped couples with their finances for over a decade and coaching in various forms for over 20 years. He believes strongly in developing cooperative relationships with other professionals to provide clients with the best possible outcomes for their lives. You guys have heard me say on this podcast before that when I am coaching a couple and they have a very tense communication style, it doesn't really work well for me personally. I'm not skilled at sort of handling some of those situations, which is why I wanted to have David on today. I think if you've ever coached a married couple, it's probably felt like you could use just a few more tools to handle some issues with communication or their different goals or general conflict or different strategies. And so I am really excited to have David on today. Thank you so much, David, for joining me on today's episode. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I'm glad to be talking with you, Kelsa. I love how much you work at helping other people. So the opportunity to join you at doing that is a real pleasure. Wonderful. Awesome. So tell us to start how and why you became a financial professional with the focus on married couples. I would love to hear more about that. Yeah, uh, that really happened organically. It was just an outgrowth of what I was doing previously. So I had been doing marriage counseling, uh, particularly premarital counseling a lot in my previous role as a minister. And as that developed, I just really wanted to get better and better at that skill. So I did further training in counseling um, and coaching through an ICF program Mm -hmm. um, and other forms of training just to get better at that. And as I did, I ran into finances as a major area for many young couples in particular. So I did further training in that as well, just continuing moving down this road of, of how I can help them better and better and when I knew it was time to transition from that job, um, I had a lot of things up in the air to decide what I could be doing for the moment. And really, I had people calling me to continue working with them in counseling in this area specifically. So mm. some of it was young people I had worked with premarital, and then they met other couples later who were struggling financially and said, hey, he really helped us. Maybe he can help you. And it grew from that. So I made the business and let it expand from there. I love it. You combined two skill sets. So you saw the need in your, the people you were already helping saw that they actually needed help in a very targeted way and decided to expand your skill set and knowledge to, to continue that journey. I love that. What types of sort of communication challenges did you see couples facing that made you realize money was an issue? So specifically around money, like what kinds of things did you observe or what kinds of things were happening? And you were like, wow, this is definitely an important part of what's happening with the couples I'm serving. Well, for the most part, they weren't aware this was a major issue. They knew they had money tension, Mm. but they didn't have any sense that they needed to fix it. In a lot of cases, they just simply believed this was just the way things are. Interesting. They, especially young couples, they just thought, okay, we have We have debt issues, we have issues with financial aid from college, but maybe this is just what it is to be an adult. And so, yeah, we don't always agree on everything, but are we ever going to agree on everything? And of course, no, not completely, but you can have a united marriage for your finances. It is actually possible. And when I said that to couples, they, they kind of were shocked. They mostly came from families where finances weren't talked about. A lot of them just didn't have experience hearing couples talk about money in ways that didn't include fighting or frustration. 
And so mm. telling them that you could actually unite together for this common enemy, this challenge that's external to your marriage, and that it could actually bring you closer together, it sounded both foreign to them and really intriguing. And so I just found that this was a place where it was the soft spot in their marriage. It was the place where you could push and you could tell they were sensitive and they were open to, to hardening that up. And so it just continued. It was, it was in every single relationship that I was counseling. There was a financial aspect that could be met and didn't matter if they were, were struggling financially with income or they were wealthy with income. Yeah. There was always a piece in there that they could develop. And that's just common in marriage counseling anyway. Uh, yeah. No one comes in with a perfect marriage because we're all flawed people. Of and when course. you bring us together, we're just flawed in multiplied <laughs> ways. So you don't right. get any better. You always have something that you can work on in it. Yeah. yeah. There's so many things you said that I think are really important, specifically for financial coaches who are listening to this episode. Um, one is it's really important, of course, that we, we as parents, let's say, or uh, people don't fight about money in front of our children, let's say. But I also think it's equally as important to uh, not not talk about money in front of our children. So that is one thing that I see. I'll have clients who are adults and they say, you know, my parents didn't fight about money growing up, but I never saw them managing it. I never saw them talking about it. And I, I find that that can be just as bad for the upbringing as, you know, like the, the disagreements or the conflict or the fighting about money, because it's this idea that like, you know, we tell our kids all the time, Michael and I, like we want them to see us sitting down and talking strategy and talking about the plan and talking about money and like having conversations around it because you have to be intentional. You have to be strategic with these things. And doing that doesn't mean something is wrong and it needs fixed. It's part of life. Right. And so just seeing them or allowing them to see us having those conversations, I think, is really important. Um, I also think what you talked about is a little bit of like asking ourselves what do our clients need to unlearn in order to get help? And I do think as financial coaches, when it comes to our marketing and our messaging and that kind of thing, we are taught to talk about the problems we solve and we're taught to talk about the pain points. But I would love to encourage coaches and counselors and professionals to talk about the other end, the result, the vision of what it can look like, how good it can look, like what a productive conversation is like and how healthy strategy and conversations can go because there's so much, it's very pervasive, the amount of sort of like money talk that talks about how hard money is and how bad money is and how you have to know where every dollar goes and like just sort of these conversations around it that make people think, well, if we're experiencing that, it's normal then because everybody, that's just the way money works where the more we can talk about how good it can be and the good types of conversations, the more it's easier for people to unlearn, you know, and identify that, oh, this could actually be better than the way we have it. So I just wanted to sort of touch on some of those things. I think it's brilliant that you were able to observe that and sort of not just, you know, brush it under the rug or keep going forward on whatever you had an agenda in for that session, but sort of like identifying like this is a really important part. So I love that. I'm curious, this wasn't one of the questions I told you I wanted to ask you, but could you speak to maybe your own philosophies on money or so like has money been an important part of your life and your marriage and like those types of things? So you were, you were kind of clued in to seeing these or did it surprise even you? Well, some of this happened some of this happened just because I was dealing with people all the time, being in ministry mm -hmm. and having people sure. come to me with, with problems. You just saw what problems were there, but some of it did arise just from a natural interest in the subject. So I had trained because I was interested in to get an RIA um, mm -hmm. and just had dug around work um, back when I was in college um, and, and had done so with family members and friends where I'd worked with them to fix their budgets, uh, again, especially when they were young and ma getting married, to really align those finances because they had different opinions and views and they had to combine them. Um, and so working through that, and I had been using programs online um, as well as spreadsheets and other things to help sure. people see their money during that time. But it was never a, it was never part of a, a business. It just was something I did because I, I was interested. So I do think I was attuned to it because of that. But it was the specific areas of noticing the, the kind of hidden conflict that really mm -hmm. clued me into it. The noticing where people assumed pain that didn't have to be there. So mm. That was really a big one. Um, whenever, 
whenever I met a couple where they kind of assumed this is just part of what life has to be. And I knew that it didn't. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I mean, that perfect. I love the way you say hidden conflict and that leads perfectly into the next question. So if it's hidden, right, the, the client isn't always coming out specifically saying I need help with X or we're struggling with Y. Right. So it's maybe not that clear even for them. What are some things that a coach should look for that might indicate that a client is or a couple, excuse me, is not on the same page. So obviously we think of like the more obvious situations, there's tension and there's yelling or, you know, those are obvious, but there's probably like this hidden conflict. What kinds of things should a coach be looking for? Right. So I've got, uh, I've got some unfortunate answers for you. The first is the easy one. Uh, It is the silence is more, more of an impact on this, uh, on answering this than what they said. So it Mm -hmm. is where they are not speaking that'll matter the most. And some of this is the obvious ones where one client just stops talking when they used to talk a lot in a subject. Mm -hmm. So suddenly you get to the issue of the mortgage and the, the, the the one spouse who was just like really animated, they've kind of lost interest or Mm -hmm. something like that. That tends to show there might be something you need to ask more of. They won't, they won't just come out and say there's a problem there. You're going to have to dig. Um, And that's the case for any time there's been a transition in the way they're communicating with one another. You just have to pay attention to that and dig. But in reality, it just requires deep listening. And it just requires a coach to actually be intentional on listening. And really, that's probably the biggest failure for most coaches that I've run into is that they want to give advice. I totally agree. Yeah, we all do. It's it's in there. And part mm-hmm. of it is going to be advice. Like we, they came to us because we know something about money. They don't. But if you don't handle listening really well, deep listening, where you are asking questions that guide better than what your advice could, then you're going to you're going to fail in this. And that mm-hmm. that's where I would say the biggest push should be for most coaches who are listening to this is to focus on how you can get better at that deep listening. I've, I've sometimes offered the strategy of finding someone who will spar with you in coaching and go in saying, I'm not going to say a single phrase that's declarative. I'm just going to ask questions. And mm-hmm. you don't end until your guided questions lead them to a solution that they can take action on based on their answers. Yeah. And if you can walk away saying, is that an action you're ready to take? And that's your final question. And you're done. You did it. You, you walked them through with never stating anything yourself, just yeah. asking them to look further and further. And so whenever you do that, whenever you, whenever you find those moments, that's where you have to ask the deep question. And I think, I think that's, that's the foundation. And do you, do you have, do you have intuition. three to five of like your favorite questions to ask that you sort of find <laughs> really help during those moments to either open up the conversation a little bit more, create a little bit more space, maybe uh, de-escalate any tension or awkwardness or that kind of thing. Or do you have just a few that are like your go-to? Yeah, I think that, well, first it's the obvious question. You should actually ask the obvious questions because they're not obvious to the person doing it. So true. So yeah. you should just straight up say, when you've got two people, again, let's go back to just the simple scenario of one person who has been talking stops on a specific subject. You can simply point it out and ask that you ask why. Say, you know, I noticed this. Do you think there's a reason why that's happening? Mm-hmm. Have you guys talked about this before? Mm-hmm. Is there any, has anything happened with this in the last few years that mm-hmm. has caused any kind of tension? And they may say no, and you can you can let it go. You can be wrong. Mm-hmm. Don't of don't course. don't put any emotional weight on being right. You you'll lose this game if you do that. So yeah, be wrong. Ask the question and find out that it doesn't matter. Toss it to the side and then move on. Um, but that's the most important is actually I go to it. the obvious one. We skip. We try to act like we know so much, and we're going to dig deep. Just start way up here with them, and yeah, then follow it down. We have in uh, our specialty toolkit, the very first one, which is sort of like embodying the role of a coach, right? And there's gives you these different hats you'll wear and sort of like during a session, you, you tend to wear these different hats. And when you first start, you sort of feel yourself taking one hat on and putting another one, like taking one hat off and putting another one on, excuse me. Um, And then after a while, what happens is you sort of seamlessly morph between one and the other. Like you just start to adopt sort of all of them at once sort of thing. But one of the things we say is, 
you know, asking questions is number one. Like you always sort of start there and listening is one of them, but then brainstorming solutions. And the way I say that and the way we teach it in that lesson is it's not offer solutions or provide solutions or give solutions. It's brainstorm solutions. So asking questions should still even be occurring, occurring when you're in the solution part of it. So it's like, what about this idea? Have you ever considered this? Or have you thought about this? Or it's like, you're not saying, I want you to do this. This is what I want you to do, right? It's not that it's still prompting a question and getting their feedback on the suggestion or the solution before you actually commit to them doing it, right? The commitment should always come from them, not from you saying, here's what I want you to go and do. Like that's you making the commitment for the client. Right. But asking questions, I totally agree with you, is super important. I'm curious, David, if you've noticed when you say silence and a person sort of stop has been talking, engaging, um, participating and then sort of stops. Is that the same thing or is it uh, just a version of I think one thing I see is they defer any decision to the other person. So they'll say, I don't have an opinion on that, or no, I don't care, or whatever she wants, or whatever he thinks is best. And so it's like they'll answer, they'll, they'll, they'll have responses, but it feels as if they are deferring any sort of decision to the other person, and they're sort of removing themselves from the equation. Have you seen that too? Yeah, and that can that can go for a number of different reasons. So again, you, you really do have to ask more mm-hmm. questions, but it could simply be the deferral of they genuinely, my partner genuinely does care more, right? Right. But there is a loss of integration when you do that. Money mm-hmm. this is this is a zero sum game. A dollar spent in one area is not available in another. So Absolutely. you can't not care about any of it because it will impact all of it. So right. any discussion should involve both in that regard. Um, so that could be happening, which does require digging. But yeah, abs- I mean, that is dead on for a common phrase of we have thought about it before. We've had this problem before. I don't want it's not worth the battle. Right. So, yeah, I, I just want to defer to you because I don't want to have a conflict. Um, and that's that's a really important thing to point out and to dig deeper into, because if you don't if you don't address it, then they will sabotage this later on. Oftentimes, right. they'll sabotage it by self-expression in other parts of their spending. And, and I mean, that's something we can get into at some point if we want. But they will, they, they will find a place to, to find their own identity through their spending because it's a part of who they are. If they feel like they're pressed out too much and you're not advocating for them to like step into that space, they will find a place and it will squeeze out somewhere else and it'll yeah. just cause conflict somewhere That's else. That's a really good way. That's a good analogy for sure. So I I feel like I think these are really great examples of there's the hidden conflict, there's sort of the deferral, you know, of the decision, or like you said, you lose the integration. Um, and then there is the, you know, I don't mean to say more toxic, because I think they're all, you know, could be equally as damaging to the couple, but um, you know, where it's really tense, they're sort of like yelling at each other or putting each other yeah. down or that kind of thing. And I find I'm actually okay when it's one person's quiet. I'm a gen, I'm a naturally inquisitive person. So, you mm-hmm. know, and I'm, I do think I'm naturally compassionate in the sense that it's like, I can sense something's going on and I just want to, you know, figure it out. Let's, let's talk about it, you know? Um, but I absolutely, I own this as a weakness of mine that when conflict gets really strong and they're, sort of like going at each other, I, I personally just shut down. Like I just, it's not something that I know how to handle. And I'm curious if you have any tips or strategies. I will admit that I, I refer that kind of (laughs) those couples out because it's not my zone of genius. It's not my area of expertise. And I'm okay with that. That's totally fine. I think we can't all be for everybody. Um, so, but I'm curious in those moments because it could happen where what I'm speaking to are the couples where that's kind of their communication style almost, where it's almost like a recurring thing. Of course, you can have a session where you have couples that are, you know, fine 90% of the time and one session is just a bit more tense or those types of things. So do you have strategies yeah. for de-escalating in that moment? Is there something you say where it's like, why don't we all take a break or go get a drink of water or sort of what is your approach in those moments? So I, I tend to think of, of coaching in general is, is there's is guidance and mm-hmm. it is reflection. So what I mean is we, we do what we can to hold a clarifying mirror to what's happening in a person's life. And so if we're doing this well, we are making them see themselves from the outside whenever possible. Mm. 
So one of the things that I'll do is I just, I will not allow myself to triangulate. I won't get pulled into that issue. I was going to say, what does that mean? I'm, okay. Right. So I'm not going to get pulled into it as one of the parties that's taking a side, as one of oh, the persons sure. that is it. now in the fight. And um, this is a this is part of a counseling theory called family systems theory that we don't really have to get into, but that 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 idea that I can get drawn into it and, sure. and pulled in is common. People, in fact, we feel good when we are on the right side of things in life. Sure. No one votes for a, a political candidate that they think is terrible. Right. So we feel good about when we're on the right team, and that happens in these situations too. And coaches need to be aware that that will happen to them if they are not really self-differentiated in these conversations say yeah i'm not in this this is with you mm -hmm. and so if we instead hold that mirror up and say like how how are both of you feeling right now mm -hmm. does this way of talking feel good mm -hmm. even saying when when your spouse talks to you this way what does it feel like and yeah. if you, you were to talk to yourself in the way that you were speaking what does that feel like and making them actually express out loud what, what they're feeling from those engagements um, oftentimes simply pulls the brakes. It just, it forces them to say, I don't, I don't want to talk like this. I'm, I'm doing so because they're talking like this. Well, that's why I'm doing it. Yeah. And so it is this, it is right. The, the back and forth that causes the tension to rise and you can step in and say, no one likes this. Yeah. So what if we instead talk about things down here in this space and it is possible but oftentimes what that means is one you may have to refer them out to marriage counselor, sure yeah. someone who's actually able to handle one of some of their underlying issues right because this is a this is a content issue it's not some of the mm -hmm. underlying issues mm -hmm. so that may happen or it may just be that you need to work with them on communicating well with some base level communication strategies and that may be enough to get them through uh, financial coaching in a way that works. Right. Brilliant. I love that. And I, I want to be really transparent because we have financial coaches who are listening, who are doing these coaching sessions. And I think where I have seen this uh, triangulation occur. And so I want to be really transparent on when I think this happens is when the dispute, the conflict is around a financial challenge and one person violated the plan or overspent mm -hmm. Or one person is the saver and one person's the spender. And I know that's like putting labels on people and it's not always that clear cut, but in the sense that like one person wants to be more conservative financially and wants to save more money. And in the coaches, financial coaches sort of brain, we're like, that's the right way to do it. So kind of where you're talking about, we want to be on the right side of things, where our where we can be easily influenced, and I think we all just sort of need to own this and be aware of it, is that this is the right thing financially. That's so clear that it's the right thing financially. So we insert ourselves and say this was the right way and we take sides, right? As opposed to the right solution is not always the best one financially. It's what the best one is whatever each person I think feels bought into. Right. So equally feels bought into. And so clearly, if a person violated the plan or whatever happened, there's missing buy in there. Right. Like you said, they're not integrated yeah. for some reason. So even if I think that, like, yeah, financially, this one looks best, I can't take that side because something is clearly a mismatch in the relationship for, as far as that financial strategy is concerned. Right. So I think that's when I see coaches do it. And I really want to caution coaches who are listening to take sides just because it's like, well, yeah, but that's what looks best financially. So of course, get in line or you're wrong. Right. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's dead on Kelsey. You are, that is that there's almost nothing more to say to that. That's exactly <laughs> it. One of the major issues. My for drop. Coaches, no. they, <laughs> they just land right in that spot of like, well, this is what I would do. And if yes. you just did what I would do, then that's the right thing. And so I'm just waiting for you to agree with me. And once you agree with me, I'm going to totally side with you from now on. And we don't do it consciously. Of course. But again, of course. this is always the case. We think we're right. If we didn't think we were right, we'd change our opinion. And since we oh, haven't, yeah. it's always great when we can get people to align with us. And we want those people to win. So you have to step back and constantly say, I'm not you. You're not me. Mm -hmm. And even if you agree with me, this could be totally wrong for your marriage and your financial situation and your life in general, because none of those things are the same at, between us. Totally. Yeah. I love that. Okay. Awesome. Uh, what tricks or strategies do you employ to help develop 
a united approach to tackling money issues? Are there just sort of one to two key high, uh, strategies that you can highlight? Yeah, so generally speaking, this is just clarity and communication. And clarity is the part that every financial coach gets. Coach gets. Like that we, we're all on that team. We all agree that one of the things we are doing for people is showing them where their money is going, how they're both spending it, and you know what are the different pockets that it's sitting in, um, all of that. That clarity matters, of course. Um, and that, that itself offers a foundation for the couple to, to stand on. They, mm -hmm. they can't argue then about what they believe their money is doing. And that does happen a lot. Like we spend too much money on your gym membership. Well, maybe, but maybe not. And since you don't even know how much you're spending, it doesn't matter yet. But once you have that foundation, you can step up on there. And the next thing, of course, is right above it. So you've got the foundation of clarity and then it's communication. And the, the operations of, um, of communicating better is that's where the hard part comes in. There's, mm -hmm. That's all I can say about that one because you can't do it as a coach. The hard mm -hmm. part of communication is providing the tools that they can, can utilize regularly in order to improve communication. Um, and there are okay. different pieces that I use for that. Like you have to get them to recognize they have an emotional connection to their money. Uh, that it, That's a real thing. And I find, mm -hmm. unfortunately, that a lot of men believe money is just a tool. It's just like their hammer in the garage. They have no emotional attachment to it. But that's not true. Their money mm -hmm. is incredibly emotional. And you can help them see that by, well, there are different ways you can help them. It doesn't matter. But you do have to get them there. For the conversation so when they can speak openly about how they are feeling about their spending or where things are at with their finances and they can do that um, in a healthy way then you're you've got some momentum there for a united front so that they're no longer fighting about well they're no longer fighting each other they're fighting with each other um, and that's a yes. totally different game um, and that that's why i do a money meeting wh where they have to meet weekly to have these conversations where communication is at the forefront of what that is. That's that's the actual goal more than assessing their money. It's actually communicating positively. Yeah, and I love this idea of a money meeting. And I, I think it's talked about so often, actually, that I think it... People think they understand it, but I what I see is that it's actually not talked about in a very practical sense. Like, how do you have mm -hmm. a money meeting? And what are the best practices for a money meeting and those types of things? And so you sort of already alluded, for example, that you do it weekly or that you recommend mm -hmm. people do it weekly. So can you talk about the advice you give around a money meeting? So maybe how do you recommend it to people? Do you have to sell them on this idea and sort of get them excited about it? Do you f find that they want to do it? And then what is the structure? How long does that last? What's the agenda for it? Do you, t you know, hear some yeah. things to avoid? I know that's a lot, but I really feel like this is such a practical concept that for couples to utilize. And yet it's not as simple as just, just go every week and talk about money. Just go do a money meeting every week. Yeah, like that's, no. That could be disastrous, right? So let's, I want to get really practical here with this. Yeah, so uh, the money meeting is required to work with me. Mm. So I actually, that's part of my onboarding is one of the things you check is I will meet with my spouse weekly. I um, love that, good for you. So they, they, when they don't do it, I actually will, I, I screenshot it when they, when they submit it. Because, so it's, it's in the queue for sure. me. So I only work virtually with them and I have it ready. And if they say that they didn't do so, I, I literally show them the screen and I say, you, you you checked this. This is this was bold. It's literally the last thing we have to check, and it's in bold. And I'm like, we said this was part of it, um, and it's not a shaming. No, approach, it's the, the expectation. Is say, like this is crucial to your success. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The reason I put it in there is the same reason I put everything else in there. That mm -hmm. this sort of thing re is required to make this function. Yeah. So good. that's one thing. Um, but the second thing is that we were, what we're addressing in the weekly money meeting is we are lowering the emotional threshold for money conversation. So mm. usually when people talk about money, it's because they need to, and they don't need to, when they're flush with cash, they might get excited about that, but they need to, because something didn't work, mm -hmm. something went wrong. And now we're talking about it. And that means I'm mad or I'm scared or I'm whatever it is, but it's never, I'm just calm and happy and let's talk calmly and happily about our financial situation mm -hmm. so this lowers the emotional bar and now they're coming at it 
from this standard of this is what we do. We talk about this right now and um, and we're we're going to no longer come to each other just when we want to rip each other's throats out about the issue. Or when something's so that's, wrong. That's right. A, yeah. Like it's yeah. I do think I mean, what you're alluding to is so accurate from what I see, which is the communication occurs in reaction to something, it's it typically yes. doesn't start proactive. And what you're describing is we're meeting consistently, even when there's nothing wrong, because that's where, you know, you, you come up with things to talk about, which is like now the future or let's get ready for this or let's talk about this coming up. Yeah. And it, it actually becomes much more proactive. It doesn't start there typically, but it is a great way of sort of lowering the threshold of tension and that sort of thing. So how long do couples typically meet for? Is there an agenda there's, there is an agenda. The amount of time uh, varies, though it usually starts for almost an hour for the first okay. meeting because they are practicing some tools and sure. they fail a lot. So they practice active listening. To, they practice uh, responsive and, and I statements. So they practice no longer making accusatory you statements mm -hmm. and they will fail. And so they'll have to try again. And uh, I work with them directly on this. I make them go through the process while they're meeting with me. Mm. Um, but that they still end up failing in the middle of it because it's sure. hard, but yeah. they go through those processes and those tend to take a, some time, but it tapers down and eventually it can be as low as 20 minutes, but mm. usually it's 30 to, to 35 minutes because they do have key things they have to go over. They have to talk about how the plan is working, what areas were difficult for them this week, what areas felt freeing for them this week, what, mm. what areas were particularly positive that their, that their spouse did. So they have to specifically note the positive things their spouse did. They're not allowed to bring up the negative things their spouse did, but mm. they do bring up the positive things. They can bring up the negative feelings they felt based on something their spouse did. But that is, there's a big difference. When I specifically totally. say you did, it's positive. When I say I felt, then it can be about some. You made negative, me feel true. blank. <laughs> yeah, that's not you allowed. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay, so, good. So you can't, you know, I, I, I felt hurt when you blank. Um, yeah. But that has to be, it has to be based on what, what you're doing or feeling um, instead of the pure accusatory fashion, which we prefer to do. It's an offloading of emotion. It's a giving that all my pain is external and you're the problem. And yeah. It's, it's our preference. So you have to yeah. fight it. Um, but but that's my goal. I, I make them say their their actual goals. They will say them to both of them. Will say them back and forth what they huh. said their goal, why they're doing this at all. We are doing this because we want this, um, and then they'll say it with I statements. I want this. So they'll both love that. they will both say this is what I want, and they'll say this is what we want. Um, so the, the, it's very structured at the beginning. It tapers off with structure throughout the program, so that at the end they only follow about four different specific things to say, which has to do with the money plan, um, the positive statements about their spouse and uh, their goals. Uh, and so, that, and since that happens weekly, the money plan stuff gets easier and easier and quicker, of course. And quicker because it's, it's totally getting synchronized between them and the plan is just functional. I love that. So yeah. And, and... More time with positive statements. Yeah. And they, and they learn to trust each other. I think too, that's something I've seen is at first there's a lot of doubt, right. Going around and, and they're, they're critical of the plan. You know, they're critical of each other. They're sort of critical of like, is this even going to work? Are we really doing this? You know, all those types of things There's so much doubt. And then week by week, I do think they work through that doubt and they start to trust each other. And that probably just speeds up those meetings as well. You don't have to get verification on every little thing because you just begin to yeah. trust the other person that they did it. And yeah, I mean, that's definitely something that we see as well. So one person, I mean, they're both retraining themselves to not say you statements, to say I statements, to follow the agenda. And also at the exact same time, they're retraining themselves in active listening, it sounds like. So can you speak yeah. a little bit more to the active listening side of that? Yeah. So active listening is uh, it's there are multiple layers to it. But getting into active listening is essentially saying I'm going to spend my time focused on you, not me. And most of us, when we are having a conversation, especially when there's any tension, we are listening for what we're going to say next. Mm -hmm. And even when we're not aware that's what we're doing, it's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And so you are actively saying it's about you, not me right now. And so the only thing I can put my brain to is you. And so one of the strategies we do, and this, this makes everyone uncomfortable when they first start, but one of the strategies is, is responsive active listening. So if 
you, Kelsa, were to be having a money meeting with me and you were to say, I feel um, upset, David, whenever you spend all this money on check cereal because I think it's a waste. <laughs> and my only response is allowed to be, I hear that you feel really upset whenever I spend this much money on check cereal because you think it's a waste. And so the only thing I'm allowed to think about is remembering what you said to repeat it back to you. Mm -hmm. Now, the purpose of that is not because just the repetition. The purpose of that is to stop my mind from thinking about anything else but what you're doing. And then the next layer would be to be able to ask follow-up questions. When you're doing the active listening, you're not going to just respond. You're going to care. So instead mm -hmm. of saying, how do I... How do I respond best defensively, which is our mode, to be like, well, check cereal is the best cereal. And so that's why, Kelsey, obviously. <laughs> I mean, obviously, it's Fruity Pebbles. I don't know what you're talking about, David, but that's okay. <laughs> that's a, a discussion for another episode. <laughs> so instead, we'd say something like, so you might repeat it back, and then you might go into the, I didn't realize that, that you felt this way, or that you mm -hmm. felt so strongly, or why does this why is this such a big thing to you? Because to me, it's just a few dollars. What What sure. is it to you? Help me to understand. Me? Yeah. And so the next layer of active listening is saying, I'm going to actually understand what you're saying, not just the attack that I feel on me. And so when you fully externalize it, you no longer are asking the questions about kind of what is going on in here until I have understood what's going on out there. Okay. And then, um, and there are a few different things that you can go down, but that's essentially it. Um, and, I do have this for your uh, listeners. As we had talked about, I set up a, a site on or a page on my site. If you just awesome. go to marriedmoney.net slash listen, um, it's that easy. Marriedmoney.net forward slash listen. Uh, you can download um, an active listening guide that you can use with anyone you're working with as a couple. And the, it's really helpful, even if you're not going to do any of the other kind of counseling stuff. The, the piece of active listening will stop the sort of back and forth fighting conversations of you did this and mm -hmm. you're the problem. It'll at least help you manage that with them. Um, so it's coupled with several steps that I mentioned, as well as the I and you statements and, and several other steps as well that get more advanced. Yeah, I love that. So there there's a number of things you've touched on that I just want to highlight really quickly that I think are so fundamental and powerful as coaches, counselors, that sort of thing. And I, I often think that they're easily dismissed when a coach first starts. So I want to, I want to touch on them. One is the power of clarity. I have said this over and over and over again in these episodes, all through the Academy, the toolkits, that kind of thing. The idea of if we could just give people clarity, what that would do for them is transformational and that sort of thing. We have the clarity maybe as the coach. So we want to go right into solution mode, but our first step is to take the clarity we have and somehow find a way to give it to the people. And not just financial clarity, but clarity on what it is that you want, how you're feeling, what's most important to you, what's influenced you up until this point in this decision, right, or in this way. I mean, so many forms of clarity. And I think that if a coach could become a student of clarity, like dive into that more. How can you get better at giving clarity to people, painting those pictures so that it's not just abstract, but it's somehow visual for people, whether it's with a diagram or something. I think it's really, really important. I think study that as much as you can. I think the second one that you touched on is asking questions. I don't think we're ever uh, done learning how to ask better questions. I think that is something that we could explore our entire life and still learn a better approach, right? Or another question or something like that. So, you know, continuing to study that as well. And then that last one is active listening. I think those three things, we're never done learning how to be better at those, I think, as coaches, as professionals, but also just as human beings, right? In our own relationships and that sort of thing. So I really appreciate you giving a resource to everybody on active listening, because I do think that is something that's an amazing tool. So marriedmoney.net forward slash listen, you guys go and download that. Thank you, David, for providing that. I really appreciate it. I think this has been really helpful. I think sometimes we overcomplicate these scenarios sometimes. And I, and I do think, I think you did a really great job of talking about how these are skills you can learn and we probably do need to get better at learning them. And also it's as simple as active listening, asking questions, you know, not getting involved in situations that you really want to stay out of. Don't triangulate sort of thing um, that 
those things are fundamental to making these conversations go smoothly and that sort of thing. And so don't skip over to these advanced strategies, right? Where, you know, all these types of things, these are the things that really make the difference in when it comes to coaching couples. Yeah, absolutely. The simple things are the things we tend to dismiss the most because they don't look complicated and therefore like they're not, they're not really the powerful tools and it's the exact opposite. They are simple, but they are hard and they require you to dig continuously. The question is thing in particular, just never Mm -hmm. give up on that essential. Just always believe that you, you've got more answers inside the client. So you can always ask more. There's you're, you've never done enough. They don't know themselves fully. So you're never going to either. So just expect you can continually ask those questions for their benefit. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that is, that's everything really. I mean, you could just shut the whole thing down. Questions yeah. are all of it. <laughs> no, we still need to talk about the Fruity Pebble thing, though. Oh. I mean, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I would I would, I would, would love to answer a question um, that you have for me as, as a thank you for being my guest on today's episode. Well, great. I have often run into the, the – well, I work primarily with married couples. And sure. I do work with single people when they come to me, but I don't try to get them. And mm-hmm. um, if, if I am full of couples already – I have to choose who I'm taking on next. And the question has always been, when do I decide to offload someone? What's the best scenario for saying like this, this is now someone better at me, uh, better than me at this particular thing. So for easy, it's an easy one for me with single people. I can just say, well, I'm full anyway, but there've been other times where I'm trying to decide whether or not this couple that I've got, I should continue working with, or I should just find someone else. So when do you offload clients to other professionals or just to other financial coaches? Yeah, great question. And I do think, and you alluded to this a little bit with your question, the way I would answer this question now compared to when I maybe first started as a coach is a little different. So I do think it sort of depends on where you're at in your journey. If you have a full client list, it's a very different sort of decision you're facing versus I'm kind of new. I'm still learning what I like most and don't like most about different client scenarios and clients I work with and that sort of thing. So I do want to address that. Um, the, your, the approach might be slightly different. So the longer in business you are and the busier you are, the more refined you become on really having confidence on who I help best, who I'm best for, the kinds of conversations around money and the areas of money that I enjoy the most. And so then I'm going to be more creative and show up better during those conversations and that sort of thing. And so the first question that I like to ask myself is, can I help this person? I mean, that is first and foremost. If I can't help you, there nothing else after, none of the questions after this matter, right? So my goal is to help people. That is why I think most of us go into this work is because we want to help people. So first and foremost, can I help you? If I can't, then I'm going to think of the person who I think is best to help you and refer you to that person, hands down. Um, it, I may love you. I may think you're amazing. I think we hit it off, your communication style. I think you're funny. Like we can riff, like all these, we get along great, all those types of things. And if I ultimately don't feel like I can help you, it doesn't matter. You know, I want the best for the client. So that is first and foremost. The second question then is, do I want to help them? And this can be, you know, not necessarily like um, capacity changes the answer to this question and sort of the perspective you take with this question, right? So do I want to help them is like, I would like to help them, but I would love to help these clients, right? So it's not always that, no, I don't want to help them. It's that I actually just have these other clients that I want to help more for any reason. Sometimes it is the it's couples and that's really where I can have the biggest impact. Maybe I'm designed to help couples, all the steps, all the tools I've designed, my emails, my communications, like they're all built and ready to go for couples more than individuals possibly. Right. So it's just easier to do. It feels like it's a more seamless uh, experience for the client as well, probably because you're built to support that journey. Right. So I do think that that's part of it. Another one can simply be personality differences and not that either person is right or wrong. That's not what I mean by that. It could just be a mismatch of communication styles, a mismatch of sort of philosophies in general, or like, you know, philosophies towards life or how we talk, um, and communicate with one another. Sometimes you can just feel like, man, I don't know if we're really, if I'm the right person, for this client, right? Like, could I help them? Yes, but I would, the amount of intentionality or the amount of work I'd have to put in to make sure I'm speaking with them the way they need to hear things and that kind of thing, it would be a lot of work for me. So again, when you're at a, uh, 
just starting out, that might be something you're excited to try and explore and experiment with a little bit. And the busy you are, the more you're like, I can be picky, right? And there is some guilt that comes with being picky. So I do want to address that. Sometimes I know when I first started, I was like, I can help everybody. I'm going to help everyone, right? And then the more I sort of refined my niche and refined who I'm best for, there some emotions come up with that, which is like, does that make me a bad person if I say no, or if I give them to somebody else or that kind of thing? Is that wrong of me? And ultimately, that's one of the reasons why I do this podcast and why I have the Academy and why I would love to see more you know, coaches and professionals and counselors out there helping people because I feel like there's plenty of people who need help, right? We need more people to support them and help them. Um, I also want to say that the reason you might not want to help somebody might be because of the specific challenge they're experiencing and whether or not you feel like you either have the knowledge, the expertise or the skill set to help them navigate that. Um, and there are times really early in my business where I would be like, I would, I would tell the client, I've never faced this before. I've never had a client face this before, but I feel confident that we can figure this out together. Like I feel, you know, I feel good about that. And I would want to, it was like an area of money that I would be like curious about myself or be like, Ooh, this is actually kind of cool. I'm excited to learn right alongside this client around the strategies or that kind of thing. Um, and then there are times where you, it's, it's a challenge. And you're like, could I learn this? Yeah, probably. Do I have a desire to learn this though? Maybe not so much, right? Like, and this is true for me with insurance and investments. And, you know, I used to be fully licensed as a financial advisor. I know you kind of understand that you spoke to that a little bit. I, I have no doubt that I'm capable of understanding those concepts and talking with somebody. I don't yeah. have a desire to learn. Like, that's not fun for me, you know? So it's not the part that I'm going to geek out with them about that. And I do think that affects your coaching sometimes if you're honest about it, right? Especially when you're fully booked and you get to be picky. You get to choose who yeah. you work with. Choose the ones where you're going to show up at your best because that's ultimately what's best for the client is you showing up as your best. Right. So um, the last factor that I, I sort of touched on in my notes here is the depth of what the client is experiencing. And this is where mm -hmm. this is one of those ones where you might not know until you're working with somebody and you're all, you've already taken them on as a client. So the other ones, I think you can kind of uh, suss out early. This one, not so much. And. I think it's really clear sometimes that the money is a symptom of something else going on. And we as the coach are not trained or, uh, you know, have the licensure or something like that in order to be the one to help them. And we need to recommend that they go seek out a therapist or something like that. And either a therapist, you know, go see, go work with a therapist while we also tackle this part of it. Right. So they can ha happen in tandem. There are so many of my clients that have therapists and we continue working together. So it's not like they go and I never see them again. It's that we're doing it together because it's like, I'm going to help you, you know, minimize the impact financially of what's happening, but we're going to keep having to put out fires. We're going to have to, we're, this is going to keep coming up unless this other thing is addressed. And this is not my area of expertise. This is not what I'm trained in. Um, but I can see it again, sort of that mirror holding up that reflection for them of this is what I'm seeing because they may not see it. And then there are times where it's like, you know, I'm going to have you go to do that to go meet with somebody and then come back to me when you're ready. And s sometimes that decision is made financially, like you can't, maybe can't afford both a therapist and a coach at the same time. There are some people where they need to pick or choose. And I think it's our job as a coach to help our clients prioritize sort of all the things that they're trying to figure out at a time and sort of like, yes, I know this is important to you, but this is actually being caused by this other thing over here and helping them like that's that clarity piece. And so that is probably the other factor that I would say is like the depth at which the issue, you know, where it's coming from. And if that's really something I can get to, or if it's really deeply rooted, that's probably something that I'm going to refer to somebody else. Does that help? Yeah, especially the guilt thing. Uh, I'm well, at least acknowledging that because that's one piece that I still have to work on. Is yeah, when people come to me for help, I I got into this business to help people. I've always been in a business to help people, so when they come for help, I feel like I'm I gotta help them. Yeah. So yeah. Totally. Now here that. is from a business strategy perspective, or like your business model, David. You do have options. So I have chosen to sort of stick with. Here's who I am best for. And, and thus, here's who fiscal fitness coaches are best for. So all of the coaches on my team, we sort of specialize in a niche and that sort of thing. Another and then we refer the clients out who maybe aren't, you know, the right fit. You could, however, 
hire a coach for your team who only works with singles, single individuals, mm -hmm. and then you are allowed to focus your efforts and your time and attention on the couples that you have designed. So you're keeping it in-house. You are still offering your guidance and help and all of that, but you are not the one individually doing it. So you are still capturing the business. So that is also a potential business model that you could consider. So I'm just going to give you plant that seed a little bit and get you thinking about right. that and see what you think. Okay. Yeah, that would be something uh, else. <laughs> right. Never planned on hiring anyone else to do coaching with me, but as I understand it, you hadn't either. <laughs> Definitely not. No, I, I literally okay. used to say all the time, I will never hire or train another financial <laughs> coach. And I have proven myself wrong on that. But now I actually try not to say never or always on just about anything because Smart life move. has proven me wrong every time I say that. So, um, so yeah, so you never know, just, you know, plant a seed. I used to say, you know, that I would never hire a CEO for my business. And that's actually something that wow. I'm considering right now actually is, is going back into a coaching role and hiring a CEO, which again, if you would have heard me a year ago, I was like, no, I'll always be the CEO of my business. No, you know, that <laughs> kind of thing. So again, like I do think, you know, we, we change the journey changes us, the, yeah. you know, the work we do, the impact we want to have, the way we think we can best go about having that impact changes. So I think it's important to just, be curious about it. So let that, yeah. let that seed simmer oh, a little bit. That's a key word there. I love the curious word. You stay mm -hmm. curious. You're going to be open to what's available. So I will, at your recommendation, Good. Kelsey, I will stay curious. Well, David, this was so helpful. And I know you have that resource at marriedmoney.net forward slash listen, but can you uh, please share how people can find you or reach you? Sure. So they can find me. Um, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and I have a slightly not so up to date YouTube channel. All of those are Married Money Financial. So you can find me at all of those at Married Money Financial. Um, and you could always head to my website if you wanted more information. I am actually always looking to connect with other coaches who might be in different areas. So especially when I want to offload single people, don't all of you come to my website. <laughs> I'm going to offer you Coaching clients. Yeah, I have a okay. steady stream of referrals for every person who reaches, every coach who reaches out to you, right? That is, that <laughs> That's not, not what, what we're I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Good. Thank you so much for being my guest today, David. I really appreciate it for sharing your expertise and all of your knowledge. I really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to end every episode with a reflection question because coaching is figuring out what you think of something and how that's impacting how you feel and the actions you are taking. So uh, today's question is, how can you expand your skills when it comes to coaching couples? So we talked about a couple different strategies or concepts or topics you could maybe lean into. Uh, what, uh, that's what I want you to ponder for yourself if you're listening to this, is how can you expand your skills when it comes to coaching couples and flex that muscle just a little bit more and keep flexing it your whole life. Be a student of this craft and uh, never stop learning, never stop being curious. Next episode, we're gonna talk about tips, strategies, and lessons from Coaches in the Client Creator Challenge. I think I have four 14 or 15 different marketing and sales strategies that I'm going to be sharing with you that have already resulted in positive impact for the coaches in the client creator challenge. So I'm going to pass them along to you in the next episode. I believe financial coaching is the best and most rewarding way to make a living. I truly love what I do. If you're ready to learn and see how to become a profitable, successful financial coach, please check us out at financialcoachacademy.com to learn more about our online programs, our free trainings and our events. As always, I love hearing from you. If you have any questions for this podcast, or if you'd like to share your answer to the reflection question with me, you can submit those at financialcoachacademy.com forward slash podcast. And if you love this podcast, please hit the subscribe button on YouTube, hit the thumbs up button on YouTube and leave me a rating or review on Apple podcasts. I would really appreciate it. And it would mean the world to me. I will see you next week, coach.